Welcome to the Falmouth and Gwinnett Circuit's Wednesday Worship for the 2nd of December. I'm Sam Goldsworthy and I'm a member of St. Day Methodist Church. This week, as we enter the season of Advent and begin to prepare ourselves for Christmas, the theme that we'll be looking at is hope, and the reading that I've chosen is Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 to 11. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling. In the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry out, and I said, What shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, and the flowers fall. But the the word of our God endures for ever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a sheep. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Some people believe that the book of Isaiah was written uh, in three parts by different authors over the course of several centuries. Uh, But for this passage, we only need to, uh, to worry about the first two of those authors. So the original Isaiah lived in Judah, which was the kingdom centered on Jerusalem, about 700 years before Jesus was born. Uh, but during a time of great political turmoil. Uh, So Judah was being threatened uh, by an aggressive and expansionistic empire called the Assyrians. And one of the main themes of Isaiah's prophecies was that Judah would soon be conquered uh, by the Assyrians as a punishment from God for the people's rebellion against him and and for the people's refusal to trust him. And so sure enough, uh, Judah was subjugated by the Assyrians um, and then again by the Babylonians who actually took the kingdom's rulers into exile. And so those rulers included the second Isaiah. Uh, we don't know what he was actually called, um, but we we can sort of surmise that he began his prophecies about 40 years um, after that invasion and after being taken into exile. And so chapter 40 is actually um, the very beginning of his contribution to the book. Um, and it has a markedly changed difference from the prophecies of the original Isaiah Um, So whereas the original Isaiah was focused mainly on God's coming judgment, um, the second Isaiah is uh, much more interested in proclaiming a message of hope. And so, for example, God calls the prophet uh, to comfort his people right at the very beginning of the passage to remind the people that he hasn't abandoned them and to tell them that their exile will will soon, uh, soon be at an end. And so some of the imagery used in the passage uh, is sort of reminiscent of the story of Ezekiel. Uh, story of Ezekiel in the, in the Valley of the Dry Bones, um, which was also written um, at around the same time during the, the Babylonian, Babylonian exile. Um, so both passages use, use the idea of the desert or, or the wasteland as a metaphor for the situation that God's people have found themselves in, uh, but also temper, that, temper that, that sort of image with the idea that, that life can come even from the most desolate of places. And both, um, both prophets also um, place the need for God's presence with his people as a prerequisite for the promise of that rest- restoration. Um, so reminding the people that, it, that the restoration isn't something that they can do by themselves, it is dependent on, on God's power. Um, and so just as in the story of Ezekiel, the breath of God is needed to bring the reformed bodies to life. In Isaiah, the restoration is based on God's coming to be with his people. We do not and cannot place all of our hope in our own strength or in, in things from this world. Um, but need to trust in God and his word. Probably the most famous part of the passage is the part about the voice crying in the desert, 
which the Gospel writers would go on to equate with John the Baptist. In John's time, Israel had again been conquered by a foreign power, this time the Romans. The succession war between rival branches of Israel's ruling dynasty had seen a Roman general brought in to mediate the dispute, but instead he'd besieged and captured Jerusalem, and even gone as far as to enter the Holy of Holies, the most sacred part of the temple, effectively desecrating it. The winner of the war had then been deposed and replaced with a new king, Herod, by decree of the Roman Senate. John's message to the people, echoing the prophet's word to pre prepare the way for the Lord, is to prepare themselves for the Lord. Uh, as the New Century Version puts it, to change their hearts and their lives, because the kingdom of heaven is near. And so drawing on the history of the exile and Isaiah's prophecy of restoration, John brings a message of hope for the people of his own time. Again, we hear that restoration will, will come because of, God's, uh, because of God's presence amongst his people. And again, we hear that this is something that we need to prepare ourselves for. John suggests that his, this preparation comes in two parts, and that we need to change both our hearts and our lives. Our hearts by hearing Jesus' call and responding to his love, and our lives by living out that love in the way we relate to others. And so in both of these contexts, Isaiah's words are a message of hope, a promise that God has not abandoned his people, and will come to rescue them and bring about restoration. And in our case, we know that God is already among us, and we know that he has sent his spirit to dwell in us, to strengthen and comfort us. And so how is this relevant today? In some ways, I think we can relate to the idea of being in exile this year, probably more than we would in a normal year. So like the people in Isaiah's time, a lot of the things that we take for granted have been taken away from us. We might feel isolated from the communities that we were part of before the pandemic, just as they'd been removed from the community that they were part of before the exile. Looking at this passage, we can remember though that the situation will pass and things will get better. Over the Even over the last few weeks, uh, we've had the news that multiple vaccines have been shown to be effective uh, in preventing new coronavirus infections. And so it won't be immediate, uh, but our lives will eventually be able to go back to normal and we'll be able to meet in person again. In the meantime though, we can only continue to wait and hope. And Advent is a season that's all about waiting and hoping, as we look forward to both Christmas and the celebration of Jesus' first coming, and uh, Jesus' pro um, promised second coming. Isaiah and John both remind us that in this season, as well as, as well as at all other times, we are called not just to wait and hope, but to prepare. Both to prepare ourselves by asking God to dwell in us and align us with his will, and also to partner with him in pre preparing the world around us, so that we might incarnate his love just as Jesus did. I'd like to finish with a short prayer. Ever present God, as we enter this season of Advent, we thank you that you are with us in every situation that we face. We thank you for the comfort we can take in knowing that you are with us and will not abandon us, even when we seem to be in the wilderness. As we approach Christmas, we ask that you help us to prepare ourselves for the coming of your kingdom, that you help us to change our hearts and our lives, that they might reflect your glory to the people around us. We ask this in the name of your Son, Amen.